Welcome to the Oklahomans of Video Studio. A quick look back at the week that was and the week that will be in the headlines. It's the Week in Review here from the Oklahomans Video Studio. I'm Dave Morris. Joined by these fellows, Mike Sherman, sports editor of the Oklahoma, and Don McCoy, business editor of the Oklahoma. Gentlemen, great to see you. Thanks. Thanks Thank for your time. Mike, you just, the seat's probably still warm. You just got off from the Thunder Thursday hangout. I know yours is. I was sitting in it. <laughs> Uh, and joining us from Washington, D.C. via Skype, our man in Washington, Chris Castile. Chris, how are you? I'm doing fine, Dave. Thanks. Some of the headlines we want to talk about today, the highway bill, the national highway bill, federal highway bill, if you will, signed this week. OG&E rates, Don Mikoy will talk about that, along with Small Business Saturday. Was it good or bad for the local uh, businesses? And then uh, Mike will bring you in on OU's bowl possibilities and the Thunder game that night, plus the Thunder season in general. But Chris, we'll start with you. Uh, Oklahoma will get a substantial boost in federal funding for roads, bridges, and mass transit. It's a bill that cleared earlier this week. It's a story that you had, Chris. Why don't you set this up, provide us a little primer on what we're talking about here? Well, basically what we're talking about is a bill, this one's five years, uh, that sets highway policy and funding amounts for the next five years. And as you said, Oklahoma's going to get a boost. Probably over five years, it'll top $100 million just for roads and bridges. Uh, You guys hearing that? I am hearing that. And as Chris mentioned, over the next five years, the state's expected to receive nearly $3.4 billion in highway funding and more than $240 million in mass transit funding. This is a story uh, Mr. Castile has reported in the Oklahoman. And Oklahoma will receive an estimated $643 million this year for the roads and bridges. Uh, Chris, was there, were there any other things attached to this bill that perhaps were a little bit tricky for our politicians? I think mainly what the um, the main and Jim Inhofe we should mention uh, Oklahoma Senator Jim Inhofe Republican was one of the main negotiators on the final version of this bill. He had a lot of influence in it, and really what they have struggled with over the last few years, and the reason it's the first bill that lasts more than a couple of years or even just a few months, is because they can't find a, a funding source for to to fix roads and bridges that uh, that, that really meets the needs. You know for decades, since the 50s, um, most road and bridge repair work on the interstates, on U.S. highways, has been funded by what motorists pay in federal gasoline tax. That's about 18 cents per gallon. But a couple of things have been have happened over the last few years, some recession-based and some, you know, because of more efficient cars, but, but basically there's not as much money goes into that fund from the gas tax because people for years we're driving less and also their cars are more fuel efficient so they don't buy as much gas and 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 also the the needs have just grown I mean you know, for obviously uh, for obvious reasons fixing a road costs one heck of a lot more today than it did you know even 10 years ago so it just they, they have struggled with this they don't want to raise the gasoline tax even when you know in a lot of places right now you've got gasoline for under you know, two dollars a gallon they don't even. They just don't want to raise it. It's not been raised since the first year, I believe, of Bill Clinton's administration. That was 1993, and it, they just don't want to raise. Uh, the Republicans just don't want to raise the gas tax. So that that doesn't leave a lot, you know, um, for them to look at. They're doing this kind of, you know, unusual, um, almost. Uh, it's not really an accounting gimmick because it's going to cost people, but it, it it has to do with the amount of money that banks who own stock in the Federal Reserve get in dividends on, on that ownership of the Federal Reserve. Kind of complicated, really obscure, and um, but they're going to take some money from that to, to, to kind of boost what, what they have from the Highway Trust Fund. So really what, what they did accomplish in this bill was to get a, a five-year bill, got some new policy in there about freight um, and transit, and uh, Gary Ridley and every state transportation director won't have to worry about you know this and that for the next five years but they've really got to grapple um, with this uh, this problem of how they're going to fix uh, and improve uh, the the US interstate and, and really US infrastructure uh, which is crumbling and you mentioned in fact you quoted Bobby Stem talking about the crumbling I-44 Bell Owl Bridge I know that is a, is a problem every time we have winter weather conditions here in Oklahoma City as well as I-244 in Tulsa, and mm -hmm. significantly, as you mentioned, this is the first time there's been a bill like this, highway bill, lasting more than two years. It's five years. What's next on this? There's still approval pending, right? Right. The um, um, it, It's going to, it's easy. 
easily clear uh, Congress. The House passed it overwhelmingly, and the president's going to sign it. So that's what's next. And I, and I probably should have mentioned, since you bring up those specific projects, you know, the death of the earmarks a few years ago um, really – really had an impact on this bill because in 2005, and again, Inhofe was the lead Senate guy on that bill, uh, it was just chocked full of pork barrel projects, you know. Every, the way they do it is basically every member of Congress gets to a certain amount of, you know, pot of money and like what road, you know, what specific. So on top of kind of what they call the formula money, the general allocation in Oklahoma's case, as you say, the first year it's going to be about $643 million. They had pork barrel to go along with it. And Jim Inhofe, he just gorged himself. You know, he had, um, and I say that, uh, you know, not, not in a critical way because uh, people back in Oklahoma loved it. He got over $100 million for the uh, Crosstown Expressway, which was a crumbling, literally, falling apart, that bridge on I-40 right where you guys are sitting, close to where you guys are sitting. And they had to replace that bridge. I think Inhofe wound up getting probably close to $200 million overall for that project. And anyway, so that's that's not part of this bill. You know, every, every dollar that goes to Oklahoma, at least as far as I know at this point, is just going to go to the Department of Transportation, which will decide how best to spend it. He's Chris Castillo. He's joining us via Skype from Washington, D.C., dropping knowledge as he always does every time we talk with him. Chris, I understand you may need to duck out, being that it's uh, 415 on the East Coast. By the way, what's All up right. with you? What's up with, well, hang on a second, Chris. What's up with your Wizards losing to my Lakers last night? I, you know, I, that, was, that was kind of frustrating, especially <laughs> um, the night before the Wizards beat Cleveland in Cleveland kind of handled them actually I think at times we're up by more than 20 over Cleveland and Kobe vintage Kobe last it was night vintage he was, Kobe he was hitting from I, I think he had his eyes closed on some of the shots that he made last night you know I think I, John Wall still wound up scoring as many points as he did but he, he, John anyway, Wall could score Kobe as was many. Kobe it seemed like there was as many Laker fans in there last night too as Wizards fans which is always frustrating I saw on Twitter last night, guys, somebody saying this is, this is the sort of game that Kobe will be that, uh, that guy who's already lost everything at the gambling table, but he gets that one winning hand, keeps him coming back. He's going to keep putting up the shots. They lost to the Sixers, I think, the night before. So then they come in and beat, you know, the Wizards. Uh, anyway, we'll get to the Thunder. That's why we love sports, right? Absolutely. That's exactly why we tune in every night. Chris, thanks for your time today. Glad to do it, Dave. Don, I'll bring you in on a story that uh, will need some explaining. OG&E, um, in the headlines, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission voted 2-1 to one yesterday to reject OG&E's $1.1 billion application for pre-approval of environmental compliance and replacement generation costs. The story, our Paul Money is covered in length. And, and, and has covered for quite some time. And he's been all over the story, right? There's been weeks of hearings on this. And, and the key word that you said there in the, in the headline is pre-approval. What's unusual about this, there's a state law where utilities in Oklahoma can get pre-approval. Usually what they do is they do a project and then they go back to the Corporation Commission and say, we need to raise our rates for the utility customers, for the electricity customers to pay for these improvements. Well, they wanted the permission ahead of time, which they can do under state law. So they had asked, they wanted to upgrade several plants to, re, to uh, comply with federal environmental regulations that are coming down the pike and they asked the Corporation Commission for pre-approval for $1.1 billion, which would have basically raised people's uh, average monthly bill, you know, close to 20 percent. I believe it, Paul Money's reported 15 to 19 percent estimated. Right. And uh, they, they rejected it, partly because they had og and &E asked for two things. One was $700 million for these improvements and another $400 million to replace a, an aging plant out in Mustang, which a lot of people, there was a lot of uh, parties who testified during these hearings, uh, a lot of the parties said, you know, that really should be a separate item. And, uh, and there, was a, there was a debate among the commissioners themselves whether they could vote on those two different proposals separately or whether they had to vote for them together. The upshot was it came down, two of the, commissioner, two of the three commissioners said, we're not going to pre-approve this expenditure. One of those that voted against it was Bob Anthony, is that correct? And that was a change of vote. It was, because earlier he issued a statement essentially saying that, that he could see his way clear to, to uh, approving this. Uh, but what happens, the upshot is, now they'll go through what, what's a more normal process, what, the way it normally happens and has happened in the past many times. 
they can go ahead and make these improvements and these changes at these power plants, come back to the Corporation Commission and say, we've spent all this money, we need to raise our rates uh, to pay for these things. And we're actually expecting some of this to be rolled into their next rate case, which could be filed any day now. So OG&E will be right back in front of the Corporation Commission shortly. But it is interesting because it, it looked like it, it, th this was a little bit of a surprise uh, that they did get rejected on this pre-approval. So uh, we'll get to go through this again. You're right, Paul Money's uh, reporting uh, that the, uh, right in front of me, OG&E expected to file the rate case this week. That could be now delayed a few weeks. How was your holidays, guys? Great. How was the cold weather? How was the weekend that treated you guys? I was in Did the press box. I was in the press box for the Bedlam you game, so I can't complain too much. My trees, uh, they're done. They're toast. Well, Don, what are you hearing from the local businesses? How was Small Business Saturday for them? Uh, we talked to a lot of local businesses up in, in Edmond uh, who really suffered because they had, a, they had a multitude of problems. First of all, you know, there was ice falling out of the sky. It was cold. <laughs> There's that, yes. And that, so that keeps, that keeps the customers away. There also were power outages. So we had stores, particularly we talked to people in Kicking Bird Square. They had no power. Their stores were open. Uh, we talked to Joe Hyde, a friend of ours who used to work here. He Best runs a books. bookstore there, uh, Best of Books. And he was actually offering customers flashlights when they came in so they could shop. But they didn't come in because they looked and it looked like it was dark and they said, well, they're closed. They weren't. So they had, they had a bad Saturday. Uh, How so, did that compare nationwide? It was, was it okay nationwide? I mean, what, bad weather was most, here. Not, yeah, most not of the stuff places. we've heard about the early Christmas shopping season has been pretty positive. Uh, you never really know until later. And, and sometimes we forget also in all of the uh, uh, publicity that Black Friday gets that that's really not the busiest shopping time most people shop a little closer to Christmas, uh, and we'll find out. Uh, I haven't heard anything dire about, about uh, uh, you know, people's buying habits this year. And I know the people in Edmond, for instance, you know, they're saying, well, we're just going to do this again next week. Or, you know, and, and Joe even said at his bookstore, I'm going to have authors in here. We're going to have things on sale. We talked to several, other, uh, several uh, other business people in Edmond who are doing the same kind of thing. And uh, people still have to get their Christmas shopping done someday. So, uh, and, and people do seem to really want to shop local around Oklahoma City. We've talked to people who, who you know, unless you're going to buy uh, an Xbox or a big screen TV, you're going to go to one of the big retailers. But if you want to buy something smaller, something more personal, if you want to support your local retailers, a lot of people tell us they like to do that. So I think the local retailers are going to be doing fine. Uh, they're just not, not going to get it done on Small Business Saturday. I was on about Saturday. Uh, I gotta tell you, the city looked like a ghost town. Between the, the winter weather and between the OU game that night, there weren't people on the streets. Some of the businesses I went into were pretty empty. I did hit the winter shops up at Leadership Square. There were a lot of people there, and that's some local shopping. The impact of that also is on the workforce. Uh, we, we have to shop, we have a lot of kids, so we have to shop at discount uh, shoe stores a lot of times, and the one we go to all the time told us that because of what happened on um, Black Friday and then Saturday, their, their payroll gets set based on what their sales are the previous week. So they may try to recoup it, but they're going to have fewer people available to win on customers because of the low sales. So if you go into some of these stores uh, this week, especially some of the smaller merchants, you may have to wait a little while. The, 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 the customers may come. But there may not be as pe many people around to stock the shelves or ring the cash registers. That's a good point. We're chatting with Mike Sherman and Don McCoy, sports editor and business editor of the Oklahoma. And let's turn to some sports action. How do we think uh, a possible OU playing on New Year's Eve, either during the day or the night, might affect local businesses? Well, we don't get the day off. You know, <laughs> we don't get uh, New Year's Eve off. It's not a holiday. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. People are going to have to take the day off. And if it's, a, it's either going to be a 3 o'clock kick or a seven, I think that's and the way it works. We find out Sunday morning around 11 a.m. We'll right? we, we should find out. We, we'll find out the matchups first. We expect to find the times around the same time. Of course, if Oklahoma is playing in the uh, – right now, there's a lot of speculation that the Big Ten champ against Clemson and OU Alabama. The assumption, I think, is that Alabama is going to kill Florida, which can't even score a touchdown these days. So if that holds true – what will they do? Well, Clemson will get to go to the Orange Bowl, most likely be in Miami. And then Alabama, which all of a sudden will be a bit of a disadvantage with 
Oklahoma just being a couple hundred miles. So. Both of those teams travel well, though. They travel well, but it'll be right down in Jerry's world in Arlington, Texas. Then you wonder which of the games will be the afternoon. You think Miami probably gets the night game, then we probably get the afternoon game. and that Which is one, good for your deadlines. Well, great for deadlines, and but that's going to have an impact. I mean, uh, you talk about ghost towns, that Thursday afternoon in Oklahoma is probably going to be a ghost town. And that's going to affect, Don, you, you'll know this better. These are stories. We're writing a 1A story on this, this question for Monday off the release. Um, and then, it, you know, what are, what are businesses that are planning on uh, having big parties and restaurants and all that do when the OU game hits? If it's in the afternoon, maybe people, uh, and they win, people feel like partying all through the night. If it's in the afternoon they lose, then what? Well, that could change things. But I also, I can, I can sense that some business owners would be pretty excited about it because you've got a, you're going to have a three o'clock crowd who, you know, if you have that kind of place that people come to watch a game, they're going to come in and watch the game. And that game's going to run until seven o'clock. And then they're going to leave happy or sad. Maybe they'll buy a few more drinks. Uh, it's also the dinner hour. It's also tip off for the Thunder game. And if you're downtown, you've got maybe a new crowd of people coming in. They may have uh, they may be turning over tables all night long, and it's and it's New Year's Eve. You got opening night. Uh, you could have you could start your crowd at noon, and you may not be done till two a.m. the next morning. Don's right. It could be one of the greatest uh, really New Year's Eve ever. <clears throat> but one thing has fundamentally changed. Uh, and our good friend Bill Hancock, uh, Hobart, Oklahoma native, uh, head of the college football playoff, uh, he told us this: the way we're doing this, the way we're moving these games, semifinal games, to New Year's Eve is going to change New Year's Eve forever. Uh, last year, it changed it for us, sort of as spectators. I mean, I, I sat on my couch and watched Oregon and somebody, Alabama, Oregon and Florida State. I think Jameis Winston's last game, um, Alabama against Ohio State, and um, you know that was nice. It wasn't involving Oklahoma. That changes everything around here. So. Um, we're going to get to participate in it this year, most likely. Let's say OU plays at 7. How could that affect the Thunder? Well, severely. Thunder, by the way, plays New Year's Eve against their hosting uh, Phoenix. Severely. I would say this. I would say if the Thunder's playing in the evening and you plan to be um, downtown for the New Year's Eve merriment, um, you may be able to uh, scarf up some cheap Thunder tickets. Might be a good time to take the whole family to go see the Thunder. Because they're playing Phoenix. It's one of 41 home dates. And the Sooners in the college football playoff championship is, or college football playoff semifinals is going to be something the likes, you know, we haven't seen. Talking about the weekend review, and I mentioned the weekend, uh, the headlines that might be coming up in weekend editions of the Oklahoma. And Mike, I'll start with you. What are some of the stories you guys are working on for this weekend? Well, I mentioned that uh, story for Monday off the announcement. Really? You know, sort of a business slash lifestyle slash sports story about how does the New Year's Eve game change the equation for people in Oklahoma. That's one we're doing. Um, on Saturday, we're going to have a guide for how to watch the uh, weekend in college football without an Oklahoma team playing. You know, we have uh, neither OU or OSU are playing, but we have a great stake in what's going on. Big Ten championship game the SEC championship game, the ACC championship game, what you should be rooting for because that whole little equation changes. If Clemson wins, if Clemson loses, Alabama's going to win. Uh, Iowa or Michigan State, how much would Michigan State win by? We're going to have a decoder ring for you know how to watch that. So those are the big stories. Don, what's going on in the business world? Well, our Brianna Bailey, uh, who, who loves Oklahoma City and has spent a lot of time in a lot of different areas, is starting an occasional series called uh, Street Stories. And she's starting out by visiting the Northwest 39th Street District uh, and just taking a look at that. She's visited a lot of people there. They're trying to generate some growth over there. And so she's going to start that series, and that ought to be interesting. We also have a special section coming out this Sunday. It's our uh, annual top workplaces rankings. We have 70 Oklahoma companies that are basically winners in the large, medium, and small categories, depending on how many employees they have. There's a lot of great information in there uh, about these companies and, and the really uh, incredible things that they do to make their uh, workplaces places where people want to be, and uh, it's really interesting. Very cool. All right. Mike Sherman, Don McCoy, and Chris Castile, who joined us earlier 
via Skype. Thanks for your time today. Certainly appreciate it. Look for these stories and more in upcoming editions of The Oklahoman and online at newsok.com.